I would like to remind Mr. Pike that he is a part of this 33rd uh, birthday of FICF. I remember that Mr. Pike was already here in 1994. He was a young man then. Now, younger. Amen. The Old Testament has this booming message that God is a God of love and is also a God of judgment. Whether we will look at the pages of the writings of the prophet Isaiah or the prophet Jeremiah as major prophets, as we look at the writings of Amos and Habakkuk and the other minor prophets, they have one and the same message, that their God is a God of judgment and a God of love. And he is the same God of the New Testament church. And he is the same God of today. And many times the people of our time always think that that is only for the Old Testament people. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His will, his aspiration, and his intention for humanity has never changed. That is why we have been de dealing with the book of Jeremiah for the last two Sundays. And today we will still deal with the book of Jeremiah chapter 39, verses 1 to 10. And the title of the message is The, the, the Day. Whether this is a disparate day or a dedication day or a designated day. This is taken from when the allied forces wanted to retake France and other parts of Europe from the Germans. And so they had this day, they called the day, when they left England, crossed the, uh, the English Channel towards France, and fought against the Germans. It, is, it was the last day of the trouble that Germany caused Europe. So last Sunday, we talked about uh, a lesson that God wanted to teach the nation Israel through Jeremiah. It was a lesson of loyalty, which is a lost lesson even in the church today. And he used the Rechabites, people who were not Jewish, people who do not belong to the exclusive club of God's chosen ones. They were in Jerusalem by accident because of the threat of Nebuchadnezzar in Judah. But the amazing thing is the Rechabites, they were so loyal to their human leader. And then God would like the nation Israel to understand why can they be loyal to the human leader and you cannot be loyal to Yahweh, me, your creator who chose you from among the many nations of the time. Then last Sunday we talked of another lesson and he this time God used a lowly potter because there was, he has a very important message for the nation Israel. And the potter, we describe him as a perfectionist, an artist. He thinks that he cannot commit a mistake. But in the process of doing this path, he marred what he was doing. And so as a perfectionist potter, he destroyed this thing, threw that in the ground, and made a new one that fits his 
perfectionism, his ideal. And so God told the nation Israel, if the potter who thinks that he is a perfectionist, yet he is imperfect, if he was dissatisfied with this marred path, what do you think of me, the perfect God who created you, who had good aspirations and ideals for you? Do, don't I have the right to destroy you and come make something out of you that satisfies my own intentions and ideals? And today, we will look at Jeremiah chapter 39. And last Sunday, the title was The Last Two Minutes. In the Philippines, when there is a basketball game, towards the end of the game, before the end, uh, two minutes before it ends, the announcer will say, last two minutes. And the last two minutes can either win a game or lose a game. Today, our title is The Day. The clock, time has ended. The game is over. Last two minutes is done. Whoever won, whoever lost, we don't care. And so, I would like for us to see two very important things in this chapter 39. First, in verse 1 of chapter 39, chapter 39 of the book of Jeremiah, the destruction. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came to Jerusalem with the intention to destroy the city. With the intention to destroy the city. We made mention the last two Sundays that God threatened the nation Israel, Israel, if you won't change, if you will not shape up, I will ship you out. And so this is now the reality. God is using, allowing Nebuchadnezzar to do his evil intention to the nation Israel. And so as he ransacked the city, the Bible declares the walls of Jerusalem were breached about the time food supplies were exhausted. They had been threatened for a long time. They cannot leave that city. They have food, but as the, the threat continued, the, 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 the supply also dwindled. And at that very moment, whether by accident or by God's plan, at that very moment when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian breached the walls of Jerusalem, they all consumed their food. The result is either they will die by the sword or they will die by starvation. Sister Sassy, yours is the decision. Was that God's plan or just a coincidence? But anyhow, in verse 3, the Bible declares that the Babylonian prince sat on the gate to assert their authority in the conquered city. They were in the gate, and they were telling the people of Israel, you were not able to resist us. The gate which was your security is under our control. You hard-headed people. You were reminded there was this last two minutes, but you will not listen to the voice of your God. So they sat there as though adding insult to injury. They already conquered the city, and they sat by the gate 
insulting the proud people of God, the nation Israel. Yes, adding insult to injury. And many times we, and even the Old Testament people, did that very thing to God. We owe him everything. But in many things that we do, we are just adding insult to God's injury. In verse 4, take note of this, chapter 39. King Zedekiah, who was the king then, when he learned about the Brits in this war, he, together with his army and some friends, in the cover of darkness, they fled the city. The king, who was supposed to be the leader of the nation, who was supposed to be the guide of the nation, in all the lessons that God had given them. But he failed to hearken into the voice of God. He never learned the lessons that were given to the nation. So he fled under the cover of darkness. But the Bible declares that the army of Nebuchadnezzar were able to run after them and got them and brought them back to the city. And there, was, there is this great disgrace on the part of Zedekiah. Leaving his city, his people behind just to save himself, yet was captured by the enemies. And he was brutally, brutally dealt with by the Babylonians. Instead of learning from the lessons that God gave the nation, the Rechabites and the Pater, and to ch change their attitude towards God and to be loyal to God, They miss the point. They never, never learn a lesson. My father would always tell me when sometimes, sometimes I become hard headed, sometimes, sometimes. He said, Son, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Ask Mr. Pike. He knows all of this. I learned this from this wise and guy. He's a, he was a friend of mine since 1994. We were still young, Mr. Pike. But now you're old. <laughs> we are. Amen. So this could have not happened if he and under his leadership, the nation only learned some of the lessons that God showed Jeremiah to be shared to the nation Israel. In verse 5, the enemy pursued him and took him back to the city. In verse 6, this is what happened to this leader who never, never entertained that his God who is a loving God yet is a God who is able to render his judgment upon his chosen people. So when Zedekiah returned to the city in his presence, in the presence of the king, the Babylonians murdered his children. In his very eyes, the Babylonians murdered his children. What a terrible day. Ano kayang sigawa ng mga bata? Tatay! Tatay! 
that was something that pierced the heart of a father. Then he killed all the nobles in Judah. Everyone who was driving a Toyota or a Civic Honda. Only American cars were spared. Japanese and the Koreans. The nobles, they were also murdered by the Babylonian soldiers. And what is, uh, is uh, very painful is Sedekiah. His eyes were taken out. He was blinded by the Babylonians. When we do not learn simple lessons, we will be having difficult examinations. And I know that because I always get, get a grade of 65. Then uh, they bound him. And then they walk, let him walk to Babylon. Blind. I think the trouble would be with cost him about seven months. Uh, Dr. Atkins, you walked that place before. Did it take you seven months? Amen. Thank you, sir. For, for, for both of us liars. You know. <laughs> and then they burned the palace of the king and the houses in Jerusalem, the Babylonians burned them. They burned the walls of Jerusalem. They burned the gates, the gate of Jerusalem. And they took all of the vessels that the Jewish people used as in the worship of Yahweh. They took the gold, the silver, everything that they thought is valuable. They took it from the house of God, the temple. And then they carried the people to Babylon as captives to be exiled exactly for 70 years. A difficult, a difficult experience for not learning, for not learning God's lessons. I know because I was exiled before for one year. I was exiled to Iloilo. And I came back, the same old guy, young. And so let us look at the result of not learning lessons from God. In Psalm 137, verses 1 to 6. Psalm 137, verses 1 to 6. Let us consider the experience that they had in Babylon. In Jeremiah 39, what they went through while they were still in Jerusalem. In Psalm 137, their experience in Babylon. Look at verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. We sat down by the river and wept. It's lonely to be in another place. We Filipinos, we are so lonely here in America. Okay? Amen. The only thing they did was look at the flow of the water in the river. And the leaves were cascading. And the ants were floating. And they said, oh, God bless their heart. They still have freedom. But they, because they learned, did not learn all the lesson well, they just sat weeping. They lost their identity. They lost their social grace. 
they lost financial uh, uh, capability, their political identity. They were nothing, captives, slaves by this Gentile nation, this nation that is outside of the realm of God's eternal will. Someone said the memory of Zion was painful for the exiles in Babylon. Painful. The despair of the, those who suffered destruction of Jerusalem. One Bible scholar said this love is not only for a place, but for its function upon their lives. They were in despair because they were away from the temple. But this guy said, it's not about the temple, but it's about the function in the temple. As they go in and offer the sacrifices, as they go there and offer the tithes and their offerings, every time they go inside, it's because they want to have a fellowship with Yahweh. So they were not in despair because of the place, because of the temple. It was what was taking place in the temple when they will worship God. It's not about this building. It's about our fellowship, our togetherness, our oneness, rubbing shoulders because we are one in the bond of love. And when we will be exiled to the Philippines, Pastor John, you will miss the place, not the building, but Pastor Johnson. <laughs> Amen. So they suffered the pain. They were in despair. This love is not only for a place, but for its function upon their lives. Why? Because it was in Jerusalem that God wanted King Solomon to build the temple. Because God said the moment the nation Israel left Egypt, when they got into Sinai, they came up with this tabernacle. And God said, this tabernacle will be my physical presence as you travel from Mount Sinai to the promised land. And this tabernacle was a precursor of the temple that they are yearning, that they are in despair because they were told that God will be in the midst of the nation. Someone said this troubling psalm is one of deeply felt emotion. Nowhere can you find this kind of emotion that I can even feel it, that you can even feel it, you know, when people are dispossessed of something that is so special to them. But the problem is, and the question is, why did, not, what, why did they not listen to God when there was still last two minutes? There's a guy in this church before. His name was Mankulas. He was about 90 years old then, but he was a groovy guy. And the ladies in the church would say, Mankulas, kailang ka magbabago? When will you change? Because he was gigolo. Always running after young ladies. <laughs> At the age of 90. He said, when my life is this short, then I will jump into the bandwagon of God. Weeping 
crying, sadness, despair. Except that is this is water under the bridge. Sabi nila, anong, ga, anong, anong kabutihan ng damo kung patay na ang kabayo? What is father good for if the horse is already dead? This is what happened to them. You can weep, you can cry, you can call upon God, you can ask for forgiveness, but it's water under the bridge. And many times we, Christians, like the people of Israel, Many times, when water is already under the bridge, that is when we get our lessons. But the day has already come for the nation. There is another saying, one will never realize, one will never realize the value of a thing until the thing is lost. They never valued God's presence in their midst, in their lives, until they lost their liberty, their freedom. And that is true with each one of us, with many of us, including me, many times. I have freedom in the Philippines the last five years, and I decided to be captured by Lulu lost my freedom. Amen, Amen Lulu. <laughs> notice, their, notice their emotion while they were in Babylon. Cannot make a joyful music because they were captives. Punta ka sa prison. Who wants to sing this is the day Behind prison bars, Pastor John, you're going to sing, I'm so happy. I'm free. <laughs> As captives, they had so many limitations. They were tormented because the Babylonians would like them to sing the songs that they were singing in the temple. But how can we sing when we are in captivity? They were taunted. They were coerced. But the clock has already stopped. The day happened. So the question is, where are we in the essence of time? Are we 10 hours away? Or are we in the last two minutes? Shall we wait for the clock to stop? Church, the God of Israel was a God of love and also a God of judgment. The God of the Apostle Paul, John Peter, God of love and a God of judgment. The God of FICF is a God of love and a God of judgment. Let us not wait for the 10 hours, for the last two minutes, let us do something before the game clock ends. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.